I am, by now, an old white man. I'm going to own that. <laughs> I'm going to give you a larger, longer-term perspective than you might usually hear. This is at least the fifth big boom of concern and attention to automation and AI in history. In the early 1800s, with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the most famous economists of the time all weighed in on the question of, were the machines about to take all the human jobs? <laughs> that was a concern at the time. In the 1930s, a big burst of innovation, and people were concerned in movies and fiction and uh, everywhere about this huge change in automation that was happening at the time. The introduction of the electronic computer created another huge burst of concern. There were presidential commissions. There were major reports. There were big front page articles in the leading newspapers about automation and it taking over all the jobs. I came along in the, with the 1980s boom. I was a young 20-year-old who read these articles and was believed the hype about how everything was about to change. And if I didn't get in there soon, it would all be too late for me because it would all be over. Uh, and in the last decade or so, we've had another burst of concern, hype, uh, excitement, expectations. And one way to frame this whole history is, is this time different? <laughs> we had, uh, for at least a century, a rapid growth of technology and improvement. For at least 70 years, a rapid growth in computer technology and their applications. And the world economy has doubled roughly every 15 years. So an enormous amount of change in every 15-year period. If you ask, what would you expect to see if this time were different, if we were about to suddenly actually replace a large fraction of the jobs with automation, much more than in the past, we might expect to see a burst of investment, a burst in economic growth, a burst in people moving into those areas. We don't actually see that much of these things compared to previous. The, the closest thing we might have ever seen was, say, the dot-com boom, <laughs> where the stock markets, at least at the time, believed there was an enormous change coming. And of course, enormous change was coming, but not quite at the rate they said, <laughs> expected. And so a big question is, is this time different? So uh, the work I'm presenting is funded by the Open Philanthropy, and I've split it into focusing on the very short term and the long term. So I'm now going to tell you about the short term. R related to, is this time different? What's happening now? Is this it? So. We have a data set, a public data set, on basically all the jobs in the US broken out into 850 different categories of jobs. And for each one, we can say how automated it was in different years. We have that data set for the last 20 years. So we can, for example, the most automated jobs are at the top of this list, air, travel agents, airline pilots, least automated at the bottom, actors, makeup artists, carpet installers. It's actually a sensible ranking. These are ranked by experts looking at the jobs, comparing them to other jobs nearby. It's subjective, but it seems to be reasonable. So we're going to be able to use this data to ask, how well can we predict which jobs are how automated? How much has that changed in the last 20 years? And when jobs get more automated, how does that change pay and the number of workers and people doing those jobs? So I'm not expecting you to read all the numbers in these screens, but I'm going to talk to the idea that here we're predicting two things. We're looking at the change over the last 20 years. One, we're asking for each job, how much did its pay change? We're also asking how much did the number of workers doing that job change? And we're using several things to predict that, but the key one is the second line, the change in automation over that period. And the key thing to notice is in that row, the second row, none of the numbers have stars next to them, which means there is no statistically significant effect of change in automation on change in pay or change in number of workers over the last 20 years for basically all the jobs in the US. Now, if we add more variables, we can start to see other interesting effects, like when education goes up, that makes pay go down and, number, pay go down and number of workers go down. But uh, these details aren't that interesting for us. The key message is, on average, in the last 20 years, when jobs got more automated, they did not lose workers. They did not change pay. We can also ask, how well can we predict which jobs are how automated? 
as you may have seen over the last several years, a lot of media articles have had articles saying about what percentage of jobs will soon be lost to automation. Vast numbers they forecast in very short time scales. Some of those are based on expert forecasts about which jobs seemed how easy to forecast. And two of the rows up here are based on those kind of forecasts. These are ways, ways people picked jobs and said, which jobs do we think will be more easy to automate in the near future? One is called computerizable, one is called machine learning suitability. In addition, up here we have things like the number of employees in the pay. Those, by simple economic theory, predict whether or not a job would be automated in the sense that if you're going to automate something, you want to automate something where you're paying a lot of money out. <laughs> so you don't want to pay that money out. So the number of workers in the pay predict that. So the first column there is about just using those simple variables. And basically, these predictions about future automatability do predict past automation. They aren't random. They actually know something. And the two variables have the expected sign of pay and employees. The higher the pay, the higher number of employees, the more we automate those things. And these seven variables explain 15% of the variation. And so we actually know something about automation just from those. However, this data set we took this from has 252 other variables. And we can use all of those to try to predict which jobs are automated. And what we see here is the best 25 of those. And throwing those in knocks out all those other variables and explains over half the variation, which says we understand a lot about which jobs in the past have been now automated. And they're mostly pretty mundane things that you understand from ordinary mundane automation. Like the most important variable is the pace of your job is determined by some piece of equipment you have to keep up with. Or that the pace of your job is really important. So, and if we look at these variables, we can say, over the last 20 years, we've seen no substantial change in what determines which jobs are how automated. And over those 20 years, on average, automation has increased by one-tenth of a standard deviation. So steady change, modest change, with very understandable determinants, is the story for automation over the last 20 years. Now, you might think something's about to change radically, but Nothing's been changing lately. And this is the story of what we see. So this is my short-term story. This time is not different. The next peak of the cycle should be in roughly 30 years, if some of you are young enough to be around for that. Stay tuned for it. But we probably have plenty of time. There's no particular urgency at the moment to deal with future AI issues. And so the fact that your investments double every 15 years mean that unless you have a high leverage now from doing something relative to 15 years from now, wait and spend twice as much then and solve problems later. Uh, that would be my main recommendation is calm down, relax. You have time, look for the long run, and work for the long run. Uh, a lot of people have the story that when something happens, it will be enormously concentrated and there'll be this one machine that takes over the world or that sort of thing. And we economists tend to be quite skeptical about that sort of thing. In the past, innovation has been modestly lumpy, but not very lumpy. And so this is a distribution of the citation lumpiness. It's actually a universal distribution across all fields. Basically, some papers get a lot of citations, but most don't get very many. And in other areas of technological innovation, we also know that innovation is modestly, but not very lumpy. That is. Most innovation is in lots of little changes, lots of small improvements. Every once in a while, there's a bigger one, but that's unusual, and most of the weight isn't in that. And so this is another way to say what you should expect is innovation that's relatively steady, modest lumps uh, that eventually goes a long distance. Now, I have this book called The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life, When Robots Rule the Earth. It came out a few years ago. And it's about what will happen in the long run when really big thing ch changes happen. And I try to show that it's possible to work out that sort of scenario, what would actually happen. And uh, it's not just making stuff up. Uh, social science can say such things. If you know the basics of the scenario, you can predict a lot of the consequences. And that's my story is that, and I'm interested in working out other scenarios. And so one just last thought I'll leave you with is the idea that evolution did this remarkable thing when it made multicellular animals it took these single cells that were wandering around that could live by themselves and had all the features necessary to be surviving separately, and it packed them together into these larger organisms with enormous redundancy in the sense that each cell had all these extra facilities and capabilities that were no longer needed in a multicellular animal. 
Why do that? Well, because it apparently was too hard for evolution to search in the space of much larger organizations, organisms, and so it was better off taking these packaged units and using them together. And so the human brain may be such, have such a future. That is, we may use things like the brains, brain emulations, in various modified ways, pack them together, and achieve great, great things from that. Even if they are not, in some absolute sense, more efficient, it might be more efficient, all things considered, to just pack them together just as we did with multicellular animals. Anyway, that's enough for now. All right. Thank you so much, Robin. Great. You can stay right there. Uh, and I'll give it to Jillian and Peter to uh, take the first stab at asking a question. OK, so I, I want to understand behind the numbers saying we haven't seen much of an impact from automation. Um, so so much of a change. A change. Automation has been why, in part, why oh, the economy has doubled every 15 years oh, for a I long see. time. Okay. So we've had a large rate of change for a century or two, but don't expect that rate of change to be different. Uh, okay. Be All right. Story. Yeah. So I, I, um, I, 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 and I can't, I couldn't see the slide, so I was trying to follow just with the uh, listening to you. Um, but I thought I heard you say that the you're, you don't see an impact on pay and uh, employment. Is that right? Yes, not, not on net. Not on net. Okay. Some go up, some go down. OK. So what happens to all the truck drivers if we develop autonomous vehicles? So as you may have heard, the current economy is not only bursting with faster growth that we might expect if this time were different, it's actually slowed down a bit relative to a few decades ago. If we automated half of all truck driving jobs in the next 20 years, and we did eight other things that big, that would be enough to bring us back up to the previous grade of growth we saw 20 years ago. That's the scale at which you need changes to really move us out of what we've been in terms of the last century's history. I must say that your presentation comes across as automation apologia. Um, I can imagine a future that is post-labor and post-scarcity material and energy. I can imagine that in the near future. I can imagine that it's arising out of optimization of the way that we organize and access our, re our resources. My question is, why does every AI expert I know when they talk about the near future, why are they still talking about things like jobs? Like, why are we... It seems tragically limited to call ourselves futurists and to ignore like the actual potential of the technology we're developing right now. Because when we get ubiquitous automation, there will be no reason for jobs. Like, it's obvious. Uh, anyway, that's my question. Well, um, if we want to be reasonable futurists, we need to be level-headed about though. the actual rates of change we can reasonably it, expect. It, it is reasonable. Like, in my lifetime, I'm going to see the decline of the working class in Appalachia, where I'm from. Like, when you say that there's no urgency, you're talking about, like, a population that is working in low uh, income and service jobs when she asked about the truck drivers. Sure, there's no urgency for you, but I'm going to see the decline of a third of the jobs in my hometown in an area that's already socioeconomically disenfranchised. So I think it is reasonable, actually, because um, <sighs> achieving scarcity or post-scarcity state is simply a matter of organization. It's not fantastic. I'm not at all recommending that we slow down. I'm not trying to hold you back. Please push forward as fast as you all can. But that's what people have been doing for a century. And the, the rate of growth we've seen in the last century is the result of people pushing yes, hard but you forward. Said there's no and so urgency. let's keep pushing forward, but don't expect a near term rate of change faster than we've seen in the past with similar efforts. You said, that, you said that there was no sense of urgency, and I'm telling you that there very much is. I'm telling you that I'm going to watch an already disenfranchised population lose even more agency because their jobs are replaced with a cheaper alternative. No unusual sense of urgency. The same sense of urgency you should have had for the last two centuries, always trying to improve the world and make it grow faster and better. Yeah. No, no. I think this is exactly the type of conversation that you should be having. And I really welcome you to the session, to attend Robin's session tomorrow, um, so you can uh, you can uh, you can you can try to talk more in depth about this. Um, all right, maybe we have time for one last very very quick question, um, and maybe with a thirty second answer, if that would be great. And then we'll break for a five minute break. Hi, Robin. I'm a big fan of your book, and um, my my name is Johan Benz. I am the United States Transhumanist Party uh, presidential candidate, and um, I'm a basic income uh, platform, and uh, I've described this basic income as a stopgap measure. I was talking to uh, Dr. Voss about. Uh, this um, uh, this idea of a sidekick app. I'm interested in these 
emulated uh, emulated uh, personalities, of course. But I wonder um, this many trillion dollar expense of a basic income. Uh, if we have uh, sidekicks emulated, what I guess my question is also a timeline question. Um, uh, is it realistic to think that in two decades we might uh, uh, we might be able to think of a basic income as uh, something that will not be necessary anymore? Is uh, what what what, do, what, do, what are your thoughts on a time frame? Twenty years is quite unlikely, but not zero. I would say if you're selling basic income as insurance against the threat that the robots take all the jobs, it would be much cheaper just to buy it straight as insurance. <laughs> Pay much lower premiums for a contract that pays off large amounts of money in the case where the robots take most of the jobs. That would be much cheaper to pay for. We could afford that compared to the large basic income for everybody. The major caveat is that needs to be internationally based with reinsurance. There's too much of a temptation at the moment to create locally based universal basic incomes, which would tax some local tax base. And most likely, the robot economy will not be evenly spread across the world. Quite likely, your region won't have much of it. So you try to tax that to pay for local people's basic income when they lose their job, and there's nothing to tax. If you use actual reinsurance with reinsurance globally based, then you have a decent chance of actually having the resources to pay when that problem happens. Thank you.